chance to sort of practice doing this uh, once before. Um, and it's funny because when uh, David asked me to do this, I thought, well, I can do that because I can just pull out a can talk on education. Uh, and as the week progressed, um, someone t I got a text that said, hey, they need your title. And <laughs> the title, admittedly, uh, was my sarcastic side responding of why are we even having grand rounds um, and then I thought to myself that the learner that I love the most is actually the intern on July 1st because that is an activated learner and I thought we are really activated learners right now the way I am uh, devouring uh, data and looking at the CDC site and thinking about our hospital and thinking about things I thought um, we are an activated learner um, and admittedly as the week went on my I've, my efforts have gone to other things, and I didn't really have a can talk that met the activated learner. But I thought that since we were all activated learners, I would tell the story uh, of this past week. And so I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully I can still see you all as well, because I actually enjoy still seeing some faces while we're doing this. Can you all see my PowerPoint there? I'm yes. assuming that yes. is a... Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'll try to keep a few people in view so I can get some head nods if I need to. Um, so uh, why are we having grand rounds? And you can see that I actually eliminated the activated learner because I think that's a, a given right now. We're sort of all activated as a society. Uh, and when we hear things, we're thinking about them, interpreting them. Um, and uh, some of the talks I give, I talk about why I decided to get an MBA uh, instead of a master's of education. And part of it was because I felt like at a large academic medical center, uh, when you're in a situation of really trying to educate a lot of people and the patient is the consumer and not the uh, resident or uh, the medical student even in certain situations, you really have to think about things differently and think about an organizational behavior. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you about uh, our story here. Let me see if this will get us to advance. Um, and I'm actually gonna talk to you about, we're in the process of clinical readiness and redistribution and I don't, First of all, I don't have any, I have a lot of disclosures, none are financial. Um, the biggest disclosure is I'm going to tell the story, but I'm also going to say that I have no idea how this is going to go down. Um, I know that if we, there are a lot of advantages to being prepared, uh, and one of them is just the psychological advantage of fee feeling that you are prepared so that you don't have as much uh, anxiety uh, in the uh, days leading up to things. Um, but what you want is you want your advantage of being prepared, uh, that it actually confers an advantage when you're actually in the, the heat of things. But I actually, I'm gonna share with you some tools that we've developed over the last week, and uh, I don't actually know that they're gonna work. Um, so this isn't like one of those grand rounds where someone gets to tell their research story and all of their experiments and uh, show you the graph and show you the success. So I'm, I'm showing you something uh, that is, is just in real time what we're doing. I think you've already seen that. Um, this started, uh, I'm going to see if you can show them. I'm going to show a few different screens here, and you're going to have to let me know if you can still see them. Um, this started, do you see one that says house staff emergency preparedness, David? Yes. Oh. I'm going to go back to this. I know it's coming back up. Um, this started with this presentation, and I'm not going to put it in full uh, thing, but this is actually a presentation that we gave in January. Uh, so back in September, uh, we started talking, I started talking to the program directors about if we ever had an emergency situation, how would we mobilize our house staff? And I felt like people really didn't understand who our house staff were and what capabilities they had and what they brought to the table. Um, and uh, so we decided that we needed to figure out a way to do that. And so we uh, had an overall goal. And these are my slides from January 19th. This is before we even thought about COVID. Um, create a mechanism for communication and potential mobilization in the event of an emergency according to classified skill level of house staff. And I think that the house staff are uniquely qualified. I felt that when I was a surgical resident here. I feel that about our young people in our training programs now. Uh, they also bring a lot more digitally native skills uh, to the workforce than many of us do who have been out in practice. They're rapidly mobilized, you know, the physical plan extremely well. They could really run the hospital uh, if they needed to uh, with some supervision, uh, but they could. Um, and then also uh, centrally located with consistent onboarding. So every year we have a database and we're able to pull them through. And so when I looked at our appointees, we have 101 different programs, all in postdoctoral, 22 of them are actually already independently licensed and that puts us in a unique situation that's actually a real advantage right now. A subset of these are already board certified or board eligible. 
Uh, and so if you look at that, that means that a subset of our house staff could go out and practice anywhere in the community right now uh, if they wanted to. Uh, and so we started categorizing them, medicine, surgery, peds, anesthesia, and who has ICU skills and who has pediatric ICU skills. Uh, and we looked at our house staff overall. And so uh, you can even see the foundation. And I asked the program directors here at Vanderbilt to help us with this. And I said, imagine though that this happens on July 1st, meaning that if you brought in a group of residents and fellows on July 1st, what could they do? And so you can see the foundation cannot perform independent services noted above. Uh, and so that would be your July 1st intern. Now we're actually in a lucky situation right now because we're in March. We've had nine months of, of training with individuals. We totaled them up and we found that out of our 1,066 house staff, uh, we had all of these totals. So we had a subset of people who could go out and practice independently. We also had ICU totals. And what's interesting is this does not capture all of our ICU capabilities because we listed, for example, our general surgery residents as either independent surgery or advanced surgery because I, as a surgeon, when I was thinking about this, was really thinking about mass casualties. I was not thinking pandemic. Uh, to the credit of our emergency response system, when we first started talking about this in September, uh, John Morris said, you know, there's really three scenarios you want to consider. You want to consider mass casualty, a structural or environmental disaster, and you want to consider pandemic. And this was in September 2019, and I thought to myself, pandemic, well, that would look very different from what I've imagined. Um, and lo and behold, that's kind of where we are now, obviously. And then these were our next steps at that point. And these are all the things that we had done. And then our idea was that we just would enter new house staff. Uh, it's done by PGY. Uh, so it's not unique to any individual house staff member and how they feel that their skills are. It's really uh, just where they are. So that's, that's sort of the first part of this story. And I'm going to share, finish sharing the rest of the story into where that went from here. Um, let me get back over to my screen share. Okay. That's the house staff part of it. Do you see now house staff overview? Okay. Yes. So um, we went through that, and that's sort of a summary of what we've done. So then when COVID came about and we started talking about this two or three weeks ago, we took these classifications that we already had um, and we actually put them into box files where our program directors could, what you don't see here, you don't see any resident names here, um, but where our program directors could uh, look and we knew who had a license, what bucket we already classified them in, what program they were in, and then yellow is whether they're here or not. So if you have people who went out because they did COVID testing or um, they would not be unavailable and then they'd be able to come back. And so our program directors update this uh, twice a day with us. Uh, we have updates to the box folder. And we've done that now probably for over a week kind of in preparation. Um, I review the workforce reports twice daily. And then I have uh, calls with our program directors in emergency medicine, pediatrics, and assess the needs among programs. And we have, have had some interesting things that we've already had to deal with. Um, and so the idea is, is that if we ever needed to horizontally deploy, which, we, which we've had to do in certain situations, uh, we could do it from a sharing to needing program. And with, with house staff, this is very important because as an educator, what you really want to do, you don't want to throw someone into either A, something they're uncomfortable, but B, you also want it to match their educational needs and match their clinical needs because we are still in training and we want to make sure that whatever you are transferring, you A, have skills to do it, but are going to learn something in the, in the process. And educationally relevant is very important. And then by ACGME standards, supervision and work hours have maintained. Now, since this presentation, ACGME has come out with stages that you can declare as an ACGME, um, an institution with ACGME program. So there's stage one, stage two, uh, where you start to uh, have uh, uh, educational programs. Uh, you're doing things online. You're not really meeting in person. And then stage three is where you're really horizontally deploying house staff and faculty a lot. Um, and when you move to that, you declare stage three and it is like a pandemic status. Uh, and essentially only four rules in the ACGME are maintained anymore. Everybody's common program requirements are put on hold. They're suspended temporarily for a period of 30 days. Uh, and those things are work hours, supervision. You always wanna make sure that trainees feel supported, supervised, um, and are able to, to carry that out. Um, and then uh, there are some rules about if you have people who could be emergently credentialed, they can do that for 20% of the year and move into that situation. Um, so then I started working, uh, we already had that in place for house staff um, and medicine, the Department of Medicine was already putting something in place there and then started working with uh, Rob Hood uh, on the faculty side, really. And so for faculty, we had a situation now that we knew we were faced with a pandemic 
Um, so we honed in the pandemic skills because um, it was a preparation now. And I will say that these slides are not my normal presentation caliber slides. These are literally notes that I've put together for this presentation because they've asked me to do it on Sunday and I figured this would be more relevant to you all. Um, and we focused only on horizontal deployment initially, um, but we said vertical should really occur within the department. So medicine should cover medicine. It's very similar. You want obviously the patients uh, to be dealing with uh, physicians who are capable of dealing with what they're dealing with. Um, and so, uh, faculty overview, um, Kim Rathnell had developed this for the Department of Medicine, and so we took her survey because she'd already sent it to the entire department, and we thought, well, if she sent that to the entire department, it'd be nice to just have the entire thing for all faculty. So all faculty on this call, you've seen this. The only thing that we added to it the Department of Medicine didn't have was uh, comfort with procedures, central lines, arterial lines, because we also had the advantage of the fact that we're behind New York, we're behind Washington, we're behind California. Um, and so we can learn what's working for them. And one of the things that they said was working very well for them was a procedure team. Uh, in those situations, typically interventional radiology and surgery helping out with that. Uh, and they, the reports from those institutions were very positive. So we kind of did the same thing with faculty that we did uh, with residents. We had foundational. Um, and so we, start, we have certain faculty who uh, could provide supporting services in any capacity, but would not necessarily uh, be able to uh, provide clinical care uh, in a COVID setting. Um, even if they are in these, they may either are far enough out from it or haven't provided that care. Uh, basic medical, advanced medical, uh, palliative, ICU skilled. And then with faculty, we did something different. We decided with residents, we knew where they landed by based on their training. If they've met their milestones and they're advanced from year three to year four, we know where they are. So we added ICU potential. And so that was someone who might've had some past experience uh, for example, with ventilators that hadn't been using it in quite some time. Um, and then we added uh, procedure skills and procedure potential, meaning people who could be trained up, because also what we were hearing from other institutions is, is that people who weren't normally in that setting uh, were being asked to be in that setting, and so we wanted to be prepared for that. Um, and so this is uh, just the overall distribution from our faculty for triage screening. You can see that there's a larger percentage in the middle, as you would expect, for could be trained. And ventilator skills, 35% said they could be trained. And I'll tell you that the biggest arm of this, because some of you have probably gone through this training, uh, has been working with Arna Banerjee over in SELA. So I asked Arna, and we'd worked together on a lot of educational projects, can you help me uh, take these, I, these attendings who could be trained so that we could potentially use them as a physician-physician extender, meaning that you wouldn't put them in the ICU by themselves, but if they were there with another attending who has critical care experience, could they actually take care of more patients in a setting that's comfortable for them, safe for patients, and also aid their critical care attendings? And so she created this four-module set that I'm happy to say that 57% of those 500 faculty have gone through module one, another 25% have already gone through module two, and our goal is, is that by Friday, we have 75% through all the modules. Module three is ongoing. So it's been this really, we've had an opportunity to prepare, uh, and that's been part of it, giving people the skills for that. There's also a hospitalist uh, set, and then we're working closely with uh, Cecilia Theobald to know where medicine is uh, and what they need. Um, and so we do the same thing with faculty. Um, obviously, I'm, I put program directors here. This would be anyone in the department who's designated. Uh, and we have sort of the same thing. Uh, we have uh, medicine, palliative, ICU, they're called buckets because that's what we were calling them. Still could be trained. It looks very different now. It goes and feeds into Tableau. Um, and in Tableau, we're able to uh, sort. So at any time I can say, give me all the people, I did this today actually for a procedure team. I said, I'll, I want all the people who are skilled in procedures, but not skilled in ICU because of the people who are skilled in ICU care, we really want to preserve for ICU care. Um, and so went and, and got a report out on that and then presented that to the department chairs and said, we're setting up a procedural team. Uh, who is not, uh, who could, could you use for the procedural team who potentially is not using your essential services right now? Um, and then we talked about protected individuals. So as I just said, those with specialized skills, ventilators, uh, procedures, hospitals, medicine, uh, emergency medicine, we didn't even have them fill out the survey uh, because quite frankly, they're already capacity, they're already on the front line um, and they're already uh, doing really amazing work and we felt that even filling out the survey was a bit of fatigue and it wouldn't help us because we wouldn't be borrowing them to help anyone else anyway. Um, exempted individuals, uh, we actually uh, have a way of, of marking them, sort of taking them out so they wouldn't show up, um, but then we also know who is exempted and are working with the master labor pool because there are lots of things to be done, for example, telemedicine, uh, speaking with patients uh, that can be done right now. And then there's a redistribution coordinator uh, in each division department who, who keeps up with that. Um, the most important thing here is, is not, we don't want to take any 
um, we want you know all the chairs to recognize that we need your help, uh, but we also recognize that you have essential services that you need to maintain, and so we ask chairs to really think about creatively uh, to do that, and Rob has handled most of our communications there. And so it's sort of understanding the difference between vertical deployment and horizontal deployment, and what we're working on is really if we have to have horizontal deployment, which we're moving into it. And then this was a communication plan that we created. So we have a leader communicator. Um, it's really Rob Hood who's done most of that. I call myself a co-leader. We work with IT very closely to uh, create those things. And then we were we were done. Uh, this was last Wednesday or Thursday, which we completed this. We started the education, and our goal was to have a reactive model. And what's here is a reactive model, meaning if medicine says, "Hey, we have a need," that gets communicated to our communicator. That goes to surgery. They share that. And so around Thursday, we realized, this is last week, should we really settle for a reactive model or could we have a proactive model? Could we give people not just the education, but the advanced knowledge that this is a place they might be um, used? And we found that sometimes when you ask people that, that induces a little bit of anxiety, but I think overall, if people are prepared and know how to prepare themselves, um, and you give them education, give them training, and, and give them support, recognizing that we are all going to be exposed to, to COVID. I don't see how it's possible. I think, you know, one of the highest places, you know, concentration probably right now is a grocery store. Um, and so it's not, it's not really a question of that in the healthcare. We want to minimize it as much as possible, slow the curve, and, and try to, to decrease that. Um, but recognizing that if we are all going to have that potential risk, what are the things that we can do to be best prepared when we have that risk? So a few things really happened that blew into some other stuff. This is, these are pitfalls. Um, certainly I'll, I'll review these this from a previous presentation. Dashboards not being updated, communication not frequent, communication not clear enough, inadequate assessments of one's own need. If medicine is, is really being stretched thin and they're not able to, to know that that's happening or communicate that, that would not help. And then protection of one's own, not sharing at the expense of our colleagues. Uh, we, are, we are all, uh, in this together. And like I said, I think all of us have to expect that just by virtue of being here, and we all have a choice not to be here, quite frankly. All of us can choose not to be here. Um, but once we have made the choice that, yes, this is the path I continue on, uh, then we want to make sure that we're helping one another and not putting this on, on one uh, group's shoulders. Um, and then arbitrary determination and exemption status, I think it's very important that that be objectively, um, objectively uh, evaluated. So uh, the other work streams, I already mentioned what Arna Banerjee is working on, uh, hospitals, and then some of our trainees have said, hey, we'd like some refreshers. So we're gonna put that out for everybody. We're not gonna track it with that. Uh, we got daily communications with nursing staff. So um, I communicate frequently with April Kafu, and we've tried to make this so that it is, because quite frankly, there will be some crossover um, because if it's, you know, a physician cannot help in the ICU, cannot do procedures, that doesn't mean that that physician can't still be a care partner. Um, and those may be the things, it's when I talked to the trainees, I said, it may, it's, we don't really want you to be asked to do things you're not comfortable with, but don't be surprised if you're asked to do things that you weren't expecting. And um, one of the stories I told trainees was that I was a resident at Nashville General and the power went out. And my job during that power outage was to carry the trays for breakfast, lunch, and dinner up to the prisoners on the seventh floor. And uh, that was my job as a surgery resident. Uh, and that was a very valuable job because eating is very important. Um, so institution reports out, report out clinical affairs. Uh, and the daily communications for this became important. I'll tell you about it a little bit. So as I mentioned, reactive model in place. And now for the last week, we've worked on being proactive. And a little bit of luck fell in our place too. Um, one thing that happened, uh, there was a small listserv of some DIOs. So DIOs are at my level over all of the, the programs. And uh, Donald Brady was on that listserv as well. And someone was asking what people were doing. And, and Dr. Brady responded and said, uh, we've got some things that we're doing here. I'll let Kyla answer those. And so I answered it, said what we were doing. And immediately, one of the DIOs wrote back and said, could you schedule a Zoom conference? And so that afternoon at 4, we had a Zoom very much like this, showed what we were doing. And 10 DIOs from around the country attended that uh, and then asked for presentations, all of our resources, our surveys that Dr. Rathnell had put forward, um, we shared those. And then I thought, wow, I didn't realize that this wasn't just something that, you know, everybody had in place. And so I shared it to the program directors in surgery and the listserv because I thought, if I can get to the other DIOs, I can give it to the program directors in surgery and they can pass it up to their DIOs. And so that was Thursday or Friday. 
And then Friday night, I got a phone call from Brian George. And Brian George uh, is a surgeon at the University of Michigan. He and I work together on a lot of uh, education projects and uh, uh, simple and operative evaluations is one of them. And his question was, uh, hey, I've got my entire IT team here. And we're sort of thinking, you know, how can we help? And I saw your email. And how can we help you at Vanderbilt? And then we're also wondering, is this something that can not just help Vanderbilt, but do we have time to help other institutions as they're going through this? And so, again, going back to my disclosure, I don't, I don't know that we have time. I don't know that this all will, be, will help. Uh, it seems logical right now, but uh, we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and so, uh, I want to show you some of the things that have happened since that. Um, so these are all the people who have been a part of that. Uh, and so I'm going to show you just a few tools that we've used in the process of creating all this. The first thing I'm going to show you is the classification for, report from December. This was when we were thinking about house staff. Uh, so the way this uh, looks, I'll review. This is our actual Excel spreadsheet. We had our independent medicine, independent surgery buckets. And we went through every program that we have here at Vanderbilt. Um, and every program uh, we establish, if it's a PGY-8, so for example, adult congenital heart disease only has a PGY-8, that person's completed the core medicine rotation of these buckets, they could be an independent practitioner if they wanted to. Uh, critical care medicine, uh, we put five for independent medicine. Again, this was July 1st, so really in a pandemic situation, this PGY-5 uh, in this situation, this is the anesthesia critical care medicine, um, could actually be in the ICU bucket. So we've reallocated some things uh, since then, and I'll tell you about that uh, with the tool, uh, emergency medical services. So you can see this is all of our programs at Vanderbilt. Um, and our program directors played a large part in this because I hounded them until every single one of them had responded that it was accurate for their program. So we felt that this was nice uh, and validated. The things we've done uh, since then, I'm gonna show you another screen. Um, is, is that we also have a, a, what I call a link table. Uh, so this is sort of buckets roughly done um, where we looked at who are all the people on our team and what are roles that they could play. And so number one would be their own role. Number two, they could easily transfer into the role. Three, they could train to fill into that role. And four, they could step in without much training. And then we tried to preserve people who should only be in their role. For example, ICU attending, but ICU team could be a procedure team attending. Um, and so we looked at that so that if we ever needed to, and so I gave you this example earlier, if you have a faculty who does not have hospitalist skills and is not critical care trained, they could step into triage, um, but they could very easily step in very easily to care partner, nursing aid. Uh, we, you know, we all may be, and it doesn't make sense to hire people when we have people who are here who might not be otherwise uh, working. Um, I'll share a few other things with you here, and these are probably the biggest output from this um, and get to my give me one moment all right you should be able to see my internet explorer right now so this is the output so when brian called um, we started a series of calls and his team worked through the weekend uh, we talked twice a day uh, and with that they immediately set up a web page they have a twitter page they said how do we get this information to people immediately and where we started was we started with the trainee pandemic role allocation tool and so you can see that here's the tool here's the background um, it goes through how you as a dio because in the process i learned that i can actually take the dio uh, log in to web address, so HGME, take de-identified information from my, all my programs, all our programs, um, here's how you do it, and then I can put it in, and then they created a tool where any institution, let's say you just have five programs, it works. Let's say you have more programs than we do, it works. You copy those two things from your HGME report, put it in, and immediately it sets out something similar to the buckets, except right now it's specific to COVID. It's, these individuals could be in the ICU. These individuals could be um, on your procedure team. These individuals could be anywhere. And so uh, these are the roles that we decided that were COVID response roles. So this is different from our original tool at Vanderbilt, uh, but these are COVID response uh, roles, and you can see all of them. 
And so we classified every resident and every year uh, with all of these. And so any DIO, so we distributed this nationally yesterday and then today uh, can do that. Um, the other uh, tools that we put up, and this one just went live like literally within the last hour, uh, is you can estimate your inpatient census. And you've seen these predictive models, but let's say that we've got 50 COVID positive patients, and let's say that we have a 60% ICU rate <clears throat> admission. And this is for the last 10 days, so that calculates from where you were. <clears throat> you can see that they did not want to make it April Fool's. They've actually put today as a second. Um, but it back calculates. Uh, and this actually has just been changed in the last 30 minutes because originally this had decimal places on it, and I asked them to fix that because there are not partial people. Um, so we actually have whole numbers for people. I'm very excited to see this. And this tells us where we might expect to be on the 12th. And so let's say on the 12th, you have 159 total inpatients and you have 172, or I'm sorry, let me re redo 100, and we'll do this one, of 159 and 96. And then you can take your ratios that input them. I can't remember what they exactly were, but we'll say these numbers. Um, and you have 20 people on the ventilator. You can actually calculate the staff that you have, and these are on sort of normalized ratios, uh, but we created these and said, if you have then, you need to stretch out in the ICU. Um, what would your, what, how could you do that? Could you double up? Um, so for example, this would be uh, asking nurses, this is total, so let's just look at ICU, uh, asking your nurses to care for patients, but then here's a second model that if you gave that nurse, a nursing assistant, um, and a care partner extra, could you go with fewer nurses because the nurses are in higher demand? Um, and so the next tool, which will be added to this tomorrow, is that any hospital can actually put in their ratio, uh, and you can change those ratios, so you can actually back calculate to, we actually have this number of nurses available, can we back calculate to that? Um, and so that's for both uh, ICU uh, and non-ICU. And so um, for uh, faculty, you'll see some similar things here. Um, but this is a suggested survey that you could utilize with your faculty, and you can see that there's some things here, skilled, need training, not comfortable, um, and these are all the things that we, uh, we consider so that you can actually specialize individuals out a little bit more uh, than ours. So I bring this up because this didn't exist even when David asked me to give this grand round, um, but this is the, when we talk about the activated learner, and I'd say probably also the activated worker, um, this is where everyone's minds are. So this is, you know, I'd say 12 or so people who were willing to, to put aside, you know, their weekend and their week and say, how can we contribute? Uh, we're not in the hospital. There are about probably three clinicians uh, on this group and the rest uh, are IT and communications groups and things. Um, and so that, uh, that's the story this week. Uh, this is all from a, a phone call on Friday night. And our goal right now is to try to get this out. You know, we're behind a lot of hospitals. Obviously, this is not helpful for New York, not helpful for California. And I honestly don't know that it's gonna be helpful for us, but it seems like it would be. It seems logical that it would be. Um, and so for hospitals and institutions that may be uh, going up on their COVID curve behind us, um, this may be something that they still have plenty of time to do. Um, and so, let me see if I can go back to my slide here. And so I just finished, and this is the last five slides I put together between 3.40 and 4 o'clock, so forgive me for that. Um, and I was trying to think of all the people who have really been a part of this uh, collaboration um, and uh, that's where I am. So I'm happy to, to take any questions. I think we wanted to try to do that in the chat box. I'm, uh, I'm the intro. Oh, thank you. So if anyone else is on, if we Essentially can just repurposed leave. for COVID. Uh, 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 so uh, you everyone, David. You've got to yeah. access to that. Yeah. 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 Kim, you there?
David, really we can hear, you. Okay. can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Back on. Okay, okay. everybody can unmute themselves. If they need to. Yes, if they'd like to. You can unmute or you can type in the chat box and I'll read the question and answer it. And David, if you have any questions, you might want to. So I'll start with a question. Um, you know, realistically, I think the question is, you know, as a neurotologist, I, I have some very finite skills and some would say no skills, but uh, wh where would you see me? I, I want to help and I, I, I want to be of, of use. Where, where would you see me um, in, in the, at the peak of this where I could be of the most help to uh, Vanderbilt? Yeah, I think... So what we see and what we look at from other institutions, and I was just texting with a friend of mine who's a surgeon at Boston this morning and what they're seeing, and they're much, much more advanced in the process than we are, obviously, um, is that the big issue is, is that we go down staff. So we could go down 30% of our staff. And so we're trying to estimate, you know, how do we have enough of a backup um, so that 30% uh, we'd be able to fill in and everything's going to open up. And so I talked about sort of extending positions um, if I if I put you in that that column, I'd say it would be triaging, you know, determining who is sick, who is not sick. I'm assuming that even as a neurologist, you still have your basic medical skills, and you can look at someone and determine what kind of help they need and triage them. Um, but there's a lot of support work that that we need. You know, we were going into this. Um, there's a shortage of, of of nurses nationally. There's a shortage of care partners. There's a shortage of support staff. Uh, support staff who could be in that role who are choosing to stay home because they don't need to come in. Um, we need everyone and all hands on deck to to help. And so it might be that you are answering call lights. And I would hope that, and I don't think knowing you well enough, I think that you would actually be very happy to contribute in any way you can. More likely, you're going to be using your medical skills. Um, especially in ENT, you all come with all the airway uh, skills. Um, and this is an airway disease, and you all have already encountered that. And so in general, you know, any basic ENT training, um, you're going and, and advanced ENT training, uh, most likely, you know, you may be on the airway team um, because we have anesthesiologists who are uh, on our specified airway team right now, but that may be ENT. And if you actually look at our classifications, uh, that's where we have ENT and ENT fellows and things classified as the uh, airway team. So someone asked uh, in the Zoom chat, how do you ask for volunteers needed on a daily basis? Is there a website? Um, so there's two types of volunteers. One, uh, we really, we probably won't ask for volunteers within our staff, uh, mainly because we know who's here, who's not, and where the needs are. Um, and I think we, we unfortunately or fortunately need to get away from asking for volunteers, but rather um, from a leadership standpoint saying these individuals, this is their clinical role right now, or this is their, um, uh, role of contribution right now. Um, we are asking for volunteers actually from the community. Um, so we are trying to, to think about that from nurses and from physicians, and we've had multiple physicians reach out to us. And so if you do know physicians who would want to volunteer, we may not ever use them, uh, but we'd like to have a deep bench. Uh, and so uh, we would send them the same survey set that we have, uh, look at their skills, look at what they have, um, and uh, and try to, to train them and educate them uh, as needed. So it really does not matter what specialty. If people are willing to help um, because they feel that that's, that's their calling is to help patients during this public health crisis, uh, we are more than willing to, to bring them into the fold.